Cambridge the first thing in 1998, and I made my decision on October 23rd of 1997 as I was walking in Times Square with my wife, and I saw a handsome index dropped 1,000 points at that particular moment. For the day, it dropped 16%. So I turned to my wife and I said, well, this is time to get out of sell side, to get into buy side. So it was in the middle of 1997-98 Asia financial crisis, and that was the market, that was the environment. So I think what the crisis did is that it basically put in place a much more, well, in theory, um, the capital structure became much clearer. What kind of risk, yeah, what kind of risk I'm taking. Um, and the industry was effectively wiped out. Um, because the capital came from, as I mentioned, predominantly foreign capital. There was some participation by local family offices and all, including some uh, in, in Hong Kong and some sort of more funds. But predominantly those investing in Asia tends to be from US, um, Europe, uh, Japan, as I mentioned. Um, and those capital dried up um, overnight because the crisis was, people forgot, you know, there was change in government in most of the country um, where recessions hit. You know, Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines all have a change of government. Uh, Malaysia barely survived because of the action and control. Even Singapore was really impacted. So I think the, the, the change was very dramatic. It basically, if I look at the private equity industry today uh, in Asia, I think it started in probably the ruin of the Asian financial crisis in 1999-2000. I think the Asian financial crisis was the key turning point in the industry. Uh, I think it's the first time that uh, fund investors were really able to buy control of large businesses, mostly because so many businesses had been nationalized by governments in Korea, and Indonesia, and Thailand. And there was a brief moment in time when the most powerful investors in the region, families, chables, uh, corporate groups in Japan were so heavily levered, they actually couldn't buy assets. So I think it created this moment in time when, um, uh, when corporate sellers and even governments were willing to sell to funds, which was a pretty outrageous concept at the time, because uh, the idea was a fund is only around for 10 years, um, ownership of a company is forever. Uh, so I think Career First Bank was certainly one of the early deals that created the foundation for the, for the industry to take off, mostly because it proved that a private equity owner could not only put up capital, but could actually help turn around and even build a business. Newbridge Capital was set up as a China fund. So we we're supposed to invest in China. But as you probably remember at that time, asset prices collapsed all over Asia but China, because China was rather closed. So the best opportunities became outside of China, and Korea was more severely hit by the crisis than anywhere else. So it was quite natural for us to look at uh, Korea. But uh, honestly, the opportunity was presented to us by the sell side. And we were in the process of raising the second fund, which would become a $400 million fund. Korea First Bank required $500 million from us. The Korean government put up with the other half of the capital. So we could put in no more than, say, $90 million. Uh, the fund size, eventually we raised our second fund, was about $450 million. So we put in about $90 million, about 20% of the fund. But we needed $500 million. We raised the rest of the money in a few weeks to close the transaction. So it was actually pretty bold to sign up a deal without having fully lined up the capital. But my thinking was, if the deal is good enough, there's no capital constraint.
When I started in 1998 in private equity, um, this was at the height of the Asia financial crisis. The uh, private equity industry and buyouts in particular were basically a thesis to be proved. Uh, I think there was a little bit of venture capital before that, uh, but Western style private equity really took hold uh, with the Asia financial crisis. Uh, with my former employer, employer uh, we did one of the first large buyouts. It was uh, a buyout of uh, the distressed bank in Korea called Koran Bank, uh, Newbridge, as they were called at the time, uh, did something similar uh, right before us of uh, Korea First Bank. The two of us went in, put in uh, a big amount of fresh capital, recapitalized, and turned around the banks. Those banks, in turn, provided much needed liquidity, credit liquidity, uh, to industry in Korea. So I think those two deals were landmark deals that both um, ushered in, that both um, highlighted uh, the Asia financial crisis, but ushered in a new era of Western style buyouts in Asia. So when I joined, um predecessor of Adam Schu, which was UBS Brinson in 99, when we first looked at Asia, um, we didn't want to look at some of the venture stuff. So the focus was in buyout. But prior to 99, uh, all the buyout, well, most of the buyout transactions were disaster. There's a group called NBO Partners that have been around since the early 90s, um, trying to do buyouts, um, really struggle. Um, Parma was trying to buy, I think a very famous case was the buyout of Delhi France, uh, the, the cafeteria chain, uh, which was a disaster. So the few case studies that we could gather at that time um, raised the question of uh, whether the whole idea of a financial investor taking controlling position and running a company, whether that, that strategy can work uh, in Asia. The idea was that it's so dominated by families and, and uh, state capital, that maybe there's no role for buyout. Um, the first few deals that really caught investors' attention was some of the restructuring deal in Korea. Chemco was one of the most aggressive. Um, obviously, if I look back at that time, the, the travel obviously broke up and so, so there was a huge... Uh, Mundo, the series of Mundo transactions was, uh, was, uh, was significant. Some of the bank restructuring Shinsei Bank uh, in Japan, Korea First Bank in Korea. Um, those were all, and those caught investors' uh, attention. Here in Hong Kong, I think it was ASAT, a semiconductor testing and chip company that was bought by, um, at that time was Chase, now JIT, um, CCMP. But those were all deals we look back, came out of uh, the restructuring agency, the bank restructuring agency. So when we first, Adam, when we first look at the market, we question the sustainability of that model because in the past it didn't seem to work for various reasons, and there was a period of time where return that uh, we start seeing huge transactions and participation from global buyer player. But it all uh, these are all government bank restructuring agency uh, managed deal. So the question is that is there a sustainable uh, pipeline when the restructuring is done? And you establish a reputation for being able to do it and uh, you build a little profile brand reputation for Newbridge Capital then it became a little easier honestly if we had not done Korea First Bank we wouldn't have done Shenzhen Development Bank which happened a few years later raising capital was was difficult because investors were um, were uh, not yet completely bought into the idea of China. And I think that really was ultimately the spark that really drove uh, large capital pools into, into this part of the world. So there was skepticism about that. There was, frankly, uh, a little bit of skepticism about what was the right model going to be. Was it going to be venture capital, growth equity, control deals, of which there were very few. Uh, and I think a lot of limited partners, particularly the larger limited partners in North America, who are familiar with the you know the model in the U.S. We're looking for what model would work in Asia, and I think it took time for that to really develop. Again, I think the Asian financial crisis was 
the initial spark for that. So we went from a $100 million fund to a $320 million fund to a $720 million fund in, uh, in, in the wake of the Career First Bank deal. And, you know, I think from there on, as the, it was really returns rather than the promise of the market that really drove fund size. So from there, it was a billion and a half and then four. And then that's when the, the, the business really reached maturity. Thank you.